Hi. Hi, John. Um, so, so yeah, we talked about the background of, of the test, the biological tests we want to accomplish, and sort of how, how knowledge graphs can be used to, to build up these models that can help us with the biological tasks. And kind of the magic in the middle is, is this idea of link prediction and the models that accomplish link prediction and knowledge graphs are, are called either network representation learning models or knowledge graph embedding models. And um, a couple of people asked in, in the week between last week and, and now, what's the difference between those two? And I guess the really, really quick overview is, is that the knowledge uh, graph embedding models care very much about the types of relationships and the directions, whereas network representation learning models usually don't. However, there's lots of uh, times where that's not true on both sides. So it seems to be more of a, a camp than a, a really hard line between them. And, and I would say that the knowledge graph embedding people really enjoy the idea of deep learning and of you know, using gradient descent or their favorite optimizer. Of course, there's better ones that people are using for everything. So gradient descent is kind of old school. Um, so that's sort of the difference that I can tell. All the methods are going to try and accomplish the same goals. And it turns out that some of them are really useful for, for this reason or that reason. And we can use kind of a, a smattering of all of them. So we also had really interesting discussion last week about what makes a knowledge graph like good. And, and this is a very deep philosophical question that I, I don't still have a good answer for it. But, um, you know, as, as we were discussing, we were kind of thinking as we're building our, our graphs using natural language processing and other tasks within Corona Y, you know, how do we know if they're good and the results from the analyses that we do based on them, how do we know those results are good? Well, um, th those are deep philosophical questions and, and we'll get back to that, especially when we start using our own Corona Y graphs. But today I wanted to, to check in and see if anybody have thought about trying to use PyKeen, which is one of the many software packages. It's one that I, I work on myself, so uh, I think it's quite good and it's gonna do some things that none of the other ones can. So we're gonna try using it and see how that works for everybody. Did anybody get a chance to try it? I, I had a look and I saw the notebook. I didn't actually run it myself, but awesome. I-, I <laughs> then, then I think we could take this time to go through it ourselves. Um, and, and then, you know, let's, let's try and, and come up with some easy tasks that might help you get engaged. And, and then next week we can talk about how do we start going forwards in that. So I'm gonna share my screen. And, then, and we're going to work in a Jupyter Notebook today. Um, oh, I just have to click the button. Good. So let me just get my Firefox shared. Great. Can everyone see this? Yes. All right. We're going to go into this Hello World folder. And we've got a Hello World Notebook. Unfortunately, there's no like HW model called Hello World. Maybe the, the unstructured model can be that one. Okay, so I put together this whole notebook that just does a couple of things, and it's gonna get us involved uh, like really fast with all of the most important stuff. And then we can start learning a little bit more about the, the specifics after. Um, the first thing you have to do is you have to install PyKeen. And, and you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with pip installing stuff, so that shouldn't be so bad. This, this uses PyKeen, it uses PyTorch, which automatically gets installed because PyKeen is built on top of, of Torch. Um, is we're gonna use a little bit of pandas and a little bit of matplotlib and then some other built-ins. So I always start my, my notebooks with the imports. Even, even as I go through and I add some extra stuff, I make sure they stay at the top. Quick and question, so Charlie, I might've missed this last week. Um, PyKeen is a package that you've developed? Yes. Okay. I, I've developed it with people who are smarter than me. Um, uh -huh. I, would, I would say, yeah. Oh, no, there's 12 contributors. Wow. Okay. We, we've had a, a core team of about five, five or six people who've uh -huh. been, you know, core. Okay. There's four of us that have been really core and then two peripheral kind of core members. And then there's been quite a bit of interest. Um, this originally came out of the work of Mehdi Ali. He's a really mm -hmm. good guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mehdi and, and uh, I used to be colleagues together at Fraunhofer. He, he left Fraunhofer after his bachelor's thesis and he did his master's thesis where he started working on this. And um, at the same time, I kind of also got into it and then we realized we were both working on it and we had been waiting for an excuse to work together again. So that started kind of this long winding uh, path of, of rebuilding a lot of old models and, and making them sort of reusable and applying them to biological uh, graphs because people aren't so interested in biological graphs and the machine learning community because they're too hard. <laughs> so, so are there are there any uh, are there comparable? I mean, so are there? I mean, there's a, there's lots of different sort of uh, graph embeddings tools. Um, 
right? So, but is this specifically for knowledge graphs or is there, or how would you, is there, what, what do you think would be the comparable software packages? Uh, that's a really good question. Why don't I bring up the paper where we sort of describe that? Okay, well, I don't want to derail, but I'll just go read the paper then. Okay, I'll send, I send you a link to that. But anyway, there's, okay. there's three or four other packages. Um, you know, the knowledge graph embedding community started with, with a bunch of people who ended up at Facebook. So, you know, huh. um, okay. so, so some of the original knowledge graph embedding models that got published when people started using that terminology were, mm -hmm. were very simple. And some of them are really useful for networks like social networks. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. And it turns out that some models more than others are scalable to distributed systems. And so, for example, Facebook maintains um, a couple models that can be run on clusters and with you know, mm -hmm. scalable number of CPUs. Not every algorithm really makes sense mathematically to do that, unfortunately. And even worse, it means it's, it's correlating with which ones are simple and which ones are more complex. Right. Simple ones are, are possible to scale across machines. Um, you know, so, so there's these knowledge graph embedding model packages. There's maybe five or six of them that are quite good. There's, there's mm -hmm. one called OpenKE, which is uh, maintained by, um, uh, I don't want to mess up the name. It's, it's HSU. It's a Chinese university. Uh -huh. There is Ampligraph, which is maintained by a company. I don't know, but, uh, you know, they're, they're all limited in, in the number of models that they've implemented and, you know, what kind of settings they've, they've got available. So we're pretty sure that PyKeen's Kind of the most featureful one at this point. Uh, okay, I I will I will yeah. I'll For now, that doesn't it. really make a difference because the the simplest thing. Oh, okay. So yeah, we're gonna start making some imports. The simplest thing is just to like you know you have a model that you've picked, and we're gonna we're gonna delete a bunch of this stuff. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna start over with no outputs, just so you guys don't get uh, cheated of of the fun stuff. So okay, I always start with with the imports at the top, and I always do sys dot version and time. And I always write my username and the versions of the software I'm doing at the top. It's a pretty good habit. Okay. So, so we're, we've already got some testing data sets built into PyKeen. So when you want to like train a model, you basically just import this pipeline function from PyKeen and you tell it what data set you want to train on and you tell it what model you want to use. Oh, hold on. Make sure that everyone can get in. Okay. So you tell it the data set you want, you tell it the model you want to use, and then you kind of, um, okay, we're actually going to have to add one more thing. We're going to say uh, training words equals dict um, epochs equals five. Okay, this isn't going to train very well because five is not very many epochs. But, you know, then, you know, it's going to start doing some training, and I guess we're kind of done. So if you haven't ever done knowledge graph embedding before and you can write this uh, like one line of code split over five lines, then you've trained your first model and you should be proud of yourself. Um, okay, so, so there's a lot more to it than that, but you know, what happens is it, it does some training. So it says, okay, no random seed has been specified. We probably wanna make sure that we keep the same random seed just so we know that the results are always the same. Um, it says some stuff about stoppers. This isn't super important. And then it has something about batch sizes. Yeah, okay. And then it evaluates at the end. Yeah, so, so I have one question. Like sure. what kind of like data set uh, we need uh, for the training? Like is there any specific format we need to? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, so um, right now I, I've, I've covered up all of the difficulty by just saying data set equals nations. And uh, this is good because you know we, we actually wanted to do a lot of benchmarking on some of these sample data sets. But it turns out that this data set thing is really powerful. You can put all sorts of stuff into this, um, this keyword. So if you do uh, from pykeen.datasets, import uh, data sets. OK, this is going to list all the data sets that are available in pykeen already. So, so we used what's called the nation's data set. And the nation's data set is like some geopolitical map and there's 12 different countries in it and then there's maybe 50 different relationships so if uh, two countries have ever had a treaty there's an edge like this country made a treaty with that one and if there's ever been like an aggressive military move you know it'd be this country made aggressive military move on that one so it's a small data set this is a good one to, to show that we can quickly train a model now it's not necessarily that a good a, hmm? oh sorry is that a, uh, a human created uh, yeah, yes okay. yes this is um and and so we can, we can start to do something with that. We can even look into it. We can import the, the nation status, nation data set. And uh, data sets actually are their own class in PyKeen. So we can, we can instantiate it. 
and inside, yeah, okay. Well, we didn't get very much from that. So this is a wrapper for it. I think there might be a nations dot describe uh, summary. Summarize, I think. Summarize? Oh yeah, you already figured this one out. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Great, so, so it's gonna tell us a little bit. So usually data sets in the knowledge graph embedding worlds, you have to take a network and split it into three parts, a training, a testing, and a validation. And uh, okay, so let's skip the validation for now. The idea is that you should train your model on, on some you know, data, wh whether it's a machine learning model for link prediction on knowledge graphs or you know, a linear regression, you should have a training set. And then later you evaluate it based on a testing set that uh, you didn't use to train it. So that's kind of what's going on here. So we split up our graph into these different parts. And, and for some of these, about that? yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. Um, uh, how do you make this split? Is there a clever algorithm or do you just kind of separate some triplets into the two different uh, training, training, testing and validation? It's an interesting question because for the benchmarks that the knowledge graph embedding community uses to make all their papers, they have exactly the same split of every data set that they reuse. However, we're not going to have uh, data sets that are already predefined, and we're not going to use benchmarking data sets in biology. We're going to want to split our own. I'm going to come back to that. This would be like the intermediate user guide after we've trained our first model and seen what we do with it. Uh, let's come back to that. But anyway, you can, you can kind of get at each of these parts of it. You can say nations.training, and then you get, okay, this is what's called a triples factory, and this is a, a object that kind of wraps around the, the triples themselves, but you can say, you know, tr triples, and you can actually look at all of them. It's just an umpire array, not too crazy. Oops, someone else is trying to join. Okay, good. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, all that stuff kind of happens in the background, and, and when you use this pipeline function, it's really the top level, uh, you know, user place. But you can also uh, create your own data set object and put it right here. And to make a data set object, you just need three of these, or, or actually you don't have to have the validation. You can just do two, the training and the testing set, and then put them into a data set object. You, know, you can also import data set. Um, and then you can make a data set object yourself. But I'll show you how to do that with like one of our graphs at the end of this, because I also have an example where we, we pull the graph from Indra and then you know, we, we train on that. Okay. Well, that's cool because that's that's where I was going to try. Yeah. On my side, so you've already done that. Nice. The, the neat thing is is remember you only have to have it like making triples. So uh, the well, we'll come back to that. So so anyway, um, so you pick your data set and and yeah, we'll come up with different ways to load data sets later. You pick your model. The one that I put in here is called Rotate. And the reason I picked Rotate is because we just published this benchmarking study last week. And after doing a ridiculous number of experiments, I think like 60,000 different training runs on, on different, you know, everything, we found Rotate's one of the best performing ones almost always. So from now on, I'm using Rotate in all of my examples. Um, there's all sorts of other things you can put in here. If you bring up the documentation for, for this pipeline function, there's like probably 30 different arguments because there's a lot of different parts to doing knowledge graph embedding. It's actually not just the, the model. In fact, in our paper, we, we sort of said that model isn't even a good terminology for this. We should be calling this the interaction function. Um, and there's all sorts of other bits to it. And, and yeah, I would suggest you do a little bit of reading rather than me trying to explain all this complicated stuff with hand waving, but there's other bits to it too. There's also what's called a loss function, which if you've been doing some, some you know, deep learning kind of stuff, usually there's a loss function in the end that you have to optimize against. There's a regularizer, which helps keep the weights inside your model small to make sure that it doesn't overfit or underfit. You can pick which optimizer you want to use, which is also another kind of high level setting. Um, and then there's also this idea of training loops. Um, so there's two different assumptions you can have about the entire universe. There's the assumption that's called the open world assumption, where you don't know what's true and what's not true besides the stuff that's already in your graph. And then there's the closed world assumption where you assume everything not in your graph is false. Uh, for us, almost always it's, it's meaningful to use the open world assumption um, when making graphs. Now it's a little, little different when training them. And for me, it's also uh, like a new idea that, that you might want to actually use the closed world assumption while training your graph and it still will be useful later. It's, it's actually, yeah, so it's, it's a little confusing. So we kind of gave it new terminology. So we call it the local, 
closed world assumption and the stochastic local closed world assumption. So you get to pick between those two. And then you also have to pick like, how do you want to sample? Um, well, if you're doing machine learning, you need positives and negatives. And, and with your knowledge graph, you have a lot of positives. Um, and so you have to kind of pick from all the possible negative edges that aren't there randomly. And there's a couple of different approaches. So you can, you can choose which approach you want. Um, then there is the idea of early stopping. Oh, hold on. Someone else just try to join. Yeah. OK. There's the idea of early stopping, which I won't go into that. But if you do that, you need to have the validation set. And then uh, evaluator. OK. The rest of these are getting a little bit uh, specific. OK. So along with every different like possibility on what kind of configuration, each of these have their own hyperparameters. So like rotate has um, an embedding size. And actually, I don't know what other stuff rotate has. So I can do from pykeen dot models import rotate. And uh, if you're doing knowledge graph embedding, you always have to have like a funny capitalization in it. Otherwise, you're not doing real knowledge graph embeddings. So uh, there aren't any hyperparameters besides the embedding dimension with rotate. That's good. There's a couple other models that have all sorts of goofy parameters, and, and some of them are kind of hard to figure out. So we tried to do our best to document what all of them are. And if you're, if you're reading this in, in the documentation on Read the Docs, you know, it renders all the math nicely. OK. But for now, uh, we don't need to change the default settings for most stuff, because we did our best to pick reasonable defaults for everything. So you should be able to just go with this. The only default you should change is this training quarks. Um, because five epochs means that it, it goes through the whole list of all the triples five times while training the model. And that's not really enough to get meaningful um, training. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to kind of look through the results and what happens. And we're going to see uh, the next step after training a model is what's called hyperparameter optimization, where we might have made some bad choices here. And we're going to try and use the computer help you get better choice. So the first thing, yeah. Oh, sorry. So for the hyperparameters, um, for the rotate model, um, I would add them to the training keyword args. Uh, nope. So every oh. everything that you can pick, you can do model quarks. Oh, okay. And so I might be like, I might decide embedding dim. Maybe I want to do fifty for this one. Maybe uh, two hundred was the default. Maybe that's too much. Why don't I try with fifty? Um, I don't know. Not make typos. Okay. So, so yeah, and then I could also, you know, change which loss I think I like. Uh, it turns out NSSA loss is really one of the good ones. So I could try, oh, shoot. Okay, some of them you have to explicitly say what the uh, parameters are. So loss quarks equals dict margin equals 1.0. And I have no idea what the reasonable adversarial temperature is for this. Let's call it 1.0 as well and see what happens. OK. Uh, yeah, so, so then every, every kind of setting you can pick also has the keyword arguments that go along with it. And this gives you kind of this high level interface. The nice thing is that when we, when we store the configuration for like, if you want to do the same training over and over again, you can save all this basically directly as a JSON file. And then you can also do like pipeline from JSON, where you just give it an object that has all of this. Because you know, if you look at this, this is basically a dictionary. Um, OK. So, so then it kind of goes into this result. And I'm going to show you what you can do with that and then how we can start looking at what came out. And then we can start making choices about how to do a better job with training. I'm definitely not claiming that our training that happened in you know, three seconds was good. We're going to have terrible results. But now you're going to get a little bit of intuition on how you can look at those results. And, and what I'm hoping is by the end of the day, you guys learn something. And you can try training your own models. And then between now and next week, I'm going to give you all the tasks to try and train the best model you can on a certain data set. So we do one of the smaller ones, so it's possible on your computers without a CPU. But you know, you might want to use some of the methods available to do your best. OK, so the next thing is we're going to want to save the results of training. This is really important. So there's this top level save to directory. So when I save that, OK. I saved it, and then I listed what's in that directory so you know what got saved. The first is the results. This has all the information about what happened during training. Then there's the metadata. This says everything about the package and how it was run. And then there's actually the model itself. This is stored as a pickle. And uh, PyTorch knows how to load and unload those pickles. All right, so now how do we actually look at the model? 
we have this result object. By the way, I can make this bigger. Maybe this is easier for everyone to see if it's bigger. So we can we can get the model right out of the result. This result object itself, I think if I if I put a wrapper, it's gonna show way too much stuff, but why don't we try anyway? Okay, yeah, this isn't so helpful. There's a lot of things inside the result package. So maybe I can do dir result, or maybe I can do print uh, for x and dir result if not x. Okay, here are all the things inside the results. We have some information about how long it took to evaluate, about the package itself and the git hash, in case you're using a, a development version, the losses at each epoch, uh, the metadata of the results, the metric results, the model itself. We have a function that actually plots the losses, the random seed. Okay, there's some other functions here too. Uh, title, training loop. I'll show you, but we're gonna walk through all those. Okay, so here's the model itself. Um, it's called Rotate, that's the name of the class, and inside PyTorch, it actually is really good at listing all the different components of a given model. So there is a variable inside the Rotate class called loss, and it has an example of NSSA loss. So this corresponds to this thing we did up here, loss equals NSSA. This also looks up a class that's called NSSA. There's a regularizer. We actually didn't specify a regularizer, and by default, we don't do regularization. Um, because you should kind of know what you're doing if you want to start adding that stuff. And yeah, I also want to force the guys in the, the core team of, of PyKeen to make some, some uh, studies on this because regularization actually is really uncommon um, in, in models when people are publishing them, even though it's a really interesting idea. So, so there's a lot of space to be explored there. Okay, and then Rotate has uh, an embedding size. So we, we gave it 100 by default. Oh, did we give it 100 by default? No, so, so rotates a special model. It actually uses complex numbers. So whatever the number that we gave it for the embedding size is gonna be double that. And it has a different embedding space for their entities and a different one for the relations. There's some models that actually put the entities and the relations in the same embedding space. And these are usually called translational distance models, uh, like trans E, trans X, trans whatever. If it starts with trans, then it's, it's one of these uh, translational models. Um, okay, <clears throat> after the fact, you can sort of get this triples factory back that comes with the model. So the model only knows about the training triples. It doesn't know about the testing ones. Like I said earlier, this is really important for good machine learning. So we can get this triples factory. We can do a little bit of a summary about it. So we know how many entities and relations and triples there are. Um, this is the next nice thing is we can plot the losses. So over every epoch, we, we ran five epochs, so there's an epoch number zero. Maybe this makes sense that we should actually call it one, but <clears throat> you know, we're seeing that the loss has been going down, and this is generally a good thing. Uh, if the loss is kind of stagnating, you don't really need to keep training, and that's what the early stop uh, is for. Um, okay, so, so we want to see that the losses are going down and that we're not uh, training after the losses stop going down because that would mean that we're going to start overfitting. Um, you could see that we could do plenty more losses. Maybe I will uh, turn the number up in the background to keep going. So I put it at 100. Um, okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the results. And oops, sorry, it's jumping around. So there's a couple different metrics that are used to, to evaluate the goodness of the knowledge graph embedding model. Um, one of them is called the mean rank. And the, I, I'm gonna apologize because these are all very hard to explain. And every time someone explains them to me, I'm, I'm quite unhappy with the way they do it. So I'm not gonna try and explain it because I'll do a bad job too. Um, anyway, what you need to know is that mean rank uh, is, is a positive integer and it can, uh, yeah, it can keep getting bigger, but you want it to be smaller. Um, it's very hard to interpret. So there's also this other one called adjusted mean rank. And this one kind of deals with the problem of it uh, being based on the number of entities there are in the model. So it normalizes between zero and one. And you want it to be closer to one, like 100%. Then there's also this other kind of um, metric called hits at K. So it could be hits at one, hits at five, or hits at 10, or whatever K you choose. And this is also a percentage reported between zero and one. And you want to see that it's closer to one. So people usually are looking at hits at 10, because hits at one is, is a little restrictive. And you kind of 
get misleading results. So okay, we're gonna we're gonna look at all of them at the same time. While I was explaining that, it finished um, training, so I'm gonna pot these new losses and see what happens. All right, now we're getting a nicer curve. You can see by 100 um, epochs, we're not really gaining a lot by doing more. So it's probably good that we stopped. Maybe we could even stopped earlier, like 40 or 60. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's let's uh, get the out of the result, we have this metric results object. And this metric results object has a function called 2DF. So we're going to put a pandas data frame with all the results in our Jupyter notebook. So again, there's some even more complicated stuff because now we have each of these metrics I just described, but we have, uh, we have sort of a perspective for each of them, either the average perspective, the worst perspective, or the best perspective. And this has to do with uh, some, some numerical issues with how the scores are sorted while they're being created. So we're gonna check out average. We can kind of leave worse than best out. And I think the best one we should just spend our time looking at is adjusted mean rank. This one actually can only be reported for the average. So uh, we got 89%. That's not bad. We actually did really, really well, even though it only trained for like 30 seconds. So, um, I, I'm not super surprised. It's quite a small data set and there's a lot of signal in it. Um, that's why we're using this as one of our examples because it is possible to train and get good results rather quickly. So I hope that um, can empower you to, to feel good. Um, it's not always the case that we're scoring well. Or there's other models that score pretty bad. So maybe you also want to try and, and compare some good models to bad models. Quick question, Charlie. This is the training loss or the test the test loss or what nope, is this? this uh, so I, I presented the loss in, in this picture right here, but mm -hmm. the metric results are not the loss. Those aren't based on the loss at all, actually. Uh, so were they uh, properties of the model? No, nope, the, the metric, the, these metric results are calculated based on the testing set. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. So the losses the are presented set. based on, on the yeah, based on the interaction function and, and the loss function uh, being combined together and applied to all the triples at each epoch. So, so then at each epoch, you, you get a loss and that loss mm -hmm. is being optimized against using the optimizer. And then mm -hmm. it, it changes the weights of all of the um, embeddings mm -hmm. based on that. I mean, it, you, can, you can think back to maybe your multivariable calculus class in college or, or high school, because some of you are, are smarties. Um, and, and you just pick, in the simplest version of this, you just pick the, the steepest direction and you, you push off the embeddings kind of that direction. Or in some formulations, you actually push it in the opposite direction because you want it to, you know, you know plus or minus problem, let's not worry about that. But then the, um, the results that, that are being presented at the bottom are based on the losses that are calculated for the testing set and then the application of these metrics, which also are a little complicated. and. I don't want to butcher an explanation of them. So it might be the case that next week, um, Mehdi will join us and he can, he can do a better job explaining how these metrics are calculated. They're, they're quite magical. And um, yeah, this adjusted mean rank is really neat. Actually, the guy who came up with it is on the, the PyKeen core team. So he's, he's coming up with a lot of really clever, elegant solutions for stuff. And this is why I think PyKeen's really nice these days because we have a lot of smart people working on it. Then by analogy, oh sorry, by analogy with uh, word embeddings, right? Like where what you're essentially evaluating is the ability of the model to predict the next word. Is this yeah. uh, is this essentially you know the ability to predict uh, neighbors in the graph based mm -hmm. on uh, no nope. things like that? Or, or this one's this got based? a totally different um, idea in the background. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can uh, open up the Pi Keen documentation because I just made a new release today with better documentation. Someone's got to do it. I mean, let's say I'm the weakest machine learning person on the machine learning team, <laughs> uh, but I'm good at writing documentation. So I, I get everybody to do that. So let's go to rotate. E each, uh, each model kind of has a mathematical basis. And so what rotate does is it represents every entity with a complex, uh, a, a, vector of complex numbers. And it considers that uh, the difference between the head and the tail, the, or the subject and the object, depending on what terminology you like, um, is actually uh, the embeddings are related by a rotation through complex space. And that rotation is, is the relationship. So, so each relationship is a certain amount of rotation in a certain direction. And so 
this is also a similar idea that you, you get from word uh, embeddings yeah. because like one of the king queen England France kind of thing. Yeah, everyone's uh, always using that king queen. Uh, the the, yeah. the translations between king and queen within a word embedding space is similar to the translation between man and woman because of where the way they appear and the words that appear around them, and and so this weird semantic translation. So this is kind of the idea is it's just using a bit of a different mathematical formulation for the space in which the translation happens. Okay, um, chat. Oh, yep. Yeah. There's, there's other models that kind of completely throw away this paradigm of translations through spaces and, and do all sorts of other absolutely wild stuff. There's some models that start with conv. All these are about convolutional neural networks. There's some models that have MLP inside them, which, which use neural networks and multilayer perceptrons. Um, KG2E and NTN also using neural networks. There's this one down here, RGCN, which is using graph convolutional neural networks, which if uh, from a naive perspective, I might have to say that it's kind of overkill to use graph convolutional neural networks to solve this problem. Like you can, but not necessary. Same could probably be said about the, the convolutional um, neural networks, but uh, you know, I, I think the data could speak for itself on that one. It's, it seems to be the case that you don't get a lot of extra benefit from using more complicated stuff. But, and, then, and then when the data is partitioned between training tests and validation, mm -hmm. um, is it just a matter of holding back uh, some of the relations or are you actually holding back uh, nodes as well as relations, right? So that in the, in the evaluation, it's, it's seeing nodes that it hasn't seen before in the training set. Yeah, this is one of the shortcomings of this kind of methodology. You actually have to have every node be in the training set. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it means these methods don't work well on data sets that have a lot of nodes with very few relationships, or, or the cases that you have to include those nodes with the very few relationships in the training set, and then make your evaluation based on the nodes that appear in lots of them. But you know, you, you're gonna in, insert oh, a lot of bias when you do that, but there, there's very few ways around this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't yeah, specifically so, oh, yeah, a problem yeah. for knowledge graph embedding models. It's, it's a problem with all sort of prediction tasks. Um, there's a couple ideas that people have had going around and how you can impute uh, embeddings for nodes. Um, but there's also other you know, non-graph based metrics for similarity between things. And this is another way that people have, have talked about making imputations based on similarities and then averaging embedding vectors. Okay, so did anyone else have any questions? Like until now you kind of understand what's going on, even though I've done a lot of hand waving and, and you're covering up some of the, the nitty gritties uh, details. Good. All right, so um, oh, this is the best part because we, we spent all that time training our model, but okay, we didn't spend that much time training it and we didn't even have to implement it. So that's really good. And we, we are you know seeing that it's kind of done training and that it's been evaluated. Now the next step is after you have a model is to use it. This is the difference between being a computer scientist and a scientist, um, you know, smack to all the computer science guys out because uh, you, most people stop. They say, okay, we did a really good job training, but we're scientists and we're going to turn it around and we're going to make predictions because what good is a predictive model if you don't ever use it to make predictions? And um, yeah, because I'm very pedantic about this, we're gonna make predictions, but when we make predictions, they are hypotheses. They could be true. We have to be scientists though, and we have to go to the lab and test them. We can't start telling people that we've declared victory yet. Um, before we do that though, we, I, I, I wrote this over the weekend to make little word clouds for, for the, um, the factories. So you can see kind of what are the top words and, and the top, um, sorry, the top entities and the top relationships showing up. So now you can see that this um, nations graph is just about you know, these 12 nations and these 50 relationships between them. And some of them are actually kind of hard to understand. Like, I don't know what um, intergov orgs three means because there's also intergov orgs and intergov orgs two. So uh, yeah, but anyway, we, we skipped that aside. Um, and, and so we have the model. Remember, we, we got that object in Python and, and all we're gonna do is we're gonna predict uh, what are the tails that should happen for Brazil and conferences. So the first part of the relationship is Brazil. The second part is conferences. And the job of the model is now to tell me who should Brazil be conferencing with. Are we ready? Drum roll. Okay. So what we get back when we when we make predictions 
is we're going to get the IDs for all of the entities. This is useful, you know, programmatically, but not necessarily for conveying to other people. Um, we get the, the label, so now we kind of know which which one is which. Then we get the score. Now this score comes from the model that we used. The score is actually the result of this function right here, this FHRT. And, and you know, this HRT is Brazil, conference, and then whatever tail. So this one is Indonesia. And so what it does is it looks up the entity embedding for Brazil, and then it does this complex, um, yeah, this is the Hadamard product in, in the complex space uh, with the relationship, which is conferences. And then, it, and then you have, you know, some entity, so you have some vector, and then you subtract from that vector element-wise the entity vector for Indonesia, and then you get some vector back, and then you take this norm of that, and then you have a, a number at the end. So you've turned this very complicated, you know, whole machine learning approach into an equation that gives you a score back. So the idea is that the, the less negative or the, the bigger it is, the more likely it is that this should be a relationship. And this is true across all of the interaction functions for all the models in PyKeen, no matter whether you use a certain loss function or a certain training assumption or anything, this is always true. And this is an implementation detail because it means that we had to understand every model and pick which ones that we switched it to be minus whatever it was. This isn't always so obvious. And I had to double check, make sure this was true for all of them as well. Okay, so, so this means that Indonesia has the least uh, negative. So I guess it's, it's closer to zero. Sometimes the scores can be over zero as well. This isn't like uh, necessarily always like this. So it's the case that Indonesia is the one that scores the best. So this is the one that Brazil should be conferencing with. And then I added this extra column called novel. And novel means, was this um, triple already in the training set? Like, did we train based on this triple? So if it's true, it means that this is not a triple that was in the training set. So if it's false, it means it was in the training set. So it's actually the case that we already knew that Brazil conferences with Indonesia. So it gets a false here. And Brazil already, con we already knew Brazil conference with Jordan that was in the training set. So this is also not novel. However, um, we did not know from the training set that Brazil should be in conference with the United States. And that's true. This is interesting. When we see the truce coming up towards the top of this list, it means that the model is making interesting predictions. And as we go to the bottom of the list, uh, you know, it's, it's not like we should care so much about the truce. Uh, unfortunately, with the knowledge graph embedding models, this is tricky to interpret. And this isn't a, a p-value, and this isn't a, a number that's been centered around zero. Uh, so, so the positive ones mean it should be an edge, and the negative ones mean it shouldn't be an edge. So this is the trickiest part about using knowledge graph embedding models versus using the network representation learning methods, where a lot of them are training something like a logistic regression of an entity embedding or an edge embedding. Like, like I sort of described last week. So it's not perfect. There's, there's no you know, solution to all problems. Uh, it's also an ongoing area of research in how do you pick the appropriate transformation to apply to these scores to make them more interpretable? Because uh, some of them, yeah, I think, I think you have to understand the statistical distribution of, of these scores that come out based on all the possible edges. And it's not clear whether, um, the kind of transformation you should apply should be different based on the different training data sets you might use. So we, we have to do our best, but you know what? It's okay because we're scientists, right? And the job of us as scientists isn't to say that our results are perfect. It's to say, let's go from the top of the list. Let's find the first one that we're not sure about already. And let's come up with the right evidence that we need to decide if we should go to the lab and do that experiment. So in, in this way, one of the shortcomings of this methodology also plays to the strength of us scientists and our sort of mindset. So it makes me very lucky because I don't have to explain my way out of that hole too bad. <laughs> All right, um, you know, you can also go the other way. You, if you know what the, the relationship and, and the tail are or the object, you can also predict what's the subject that should go with it. Same idea. All right, we're at the bottom of the notebook. And let me just check what somebody messaged. There's a question. Um, for what it's worth, I got USA, USSR, Netherlands at the top. Hits. Curious to see how stable the results are for this amount of training. All right. It's a really good question. 
So, um, well, we managed to do another meeting where I talked the whole time. You all have to stop me from doing that. I hope, I hope next week that uh, you're all gonna do the talking. So, so this is what I think that would be cool for us to do between now and next week. It would be neat if everybody gets a chance to try uh, downloading the software and, and do, running this notebook from the top to the bottom. And I think what we should do is we should kind of move up in the world. We should go to the next more difficult uh, data set after nations. And so the next one that's a little bit trickier, it's going to take a little bit more time, is called the Kinships data set. So this one's going to take, okay, maybe it's going to take a minute to train the whole thing. Yeah. So what I want you guys to do is do your best with training the Kinships. Um, try a couple different models. Rotate is a really good one because this has this idea of rotating within complex space. Maybe you want to try the trans E model, which is a, a rotation through Euclidean, uh, sorry, a translation through Euclidean space. Maybe you want to get really, really wild and try the convolutional um, neural network approaches, conv E or conv KB. Maybe they make your computer explode without a GPU. I don't know. Um, yeah, so, so try a couple models. Maybe you can try reading the documentation and figuring out if you want to change some of the keyword arguments. Um, and, and you can play around with, with those and make some comparisons. And, and John just had a really interesting um, you know, note that he sent that if, if you train it on your computer, you might get different results. So it might be the case that we should investigate how stable are the results. This is something that the, the knowledge graph embedding people don't normally do. And it's something that I think should be included with, um, with any given uh, evaluation. You should train the same set of parameters several times and see if the results really are the same each time. Um, you know, one of the things that we did when we did this benchmarking paper is we took the ones that we thought were the best and we trained all them five times each, but we didn't uh, check the specific results. We just checked how they performed to make sure that that was stable, that it wasn't like if you pick the perfect random seed, you can make it perform really well one time, but if you pick a bad random seed, it performs terrible the rest of the time. Uh, so we were, pretty happy to see that you know models were mostly stable for most of the time. There's only a couple ones that really were unstable. But you know, for your peace of mind, it would be nice to try a couple of combinations of models of, of losses. Um, I would say you don't necessarily need to think about the training assumption, like maybe sticking to the default one's okay. So this would be a good chance for you to, to learn a little bit of stuff. I mean, there's a lot to read. So you know, maybe just trying things is more important at this point. You can see what happens when you do fewer or, or more epochs. Like maybe you'll start to understand how overfitting works. Like we don't have a visual pipeline for showing if you're overfitting or not. It would also be nice to show the losses for um, for the training set, but that's kind of cheating, right? You don't want to um, to optimize your model based on the the training set. But you know, there's this famous picture where you see like the the epochs. Um, so so the training data, the losses are going down, but eventually the losses for the testing set start going back up. And that's, that's when you know you should stop. Um, but you're cheating if you do that ahead of time. So you're not allowed to do that unless you're, you're playing. Um, okay, and then there's this last thing, which maybe, maybe you can get to. Um, this is from pykeen.hpo, import HPO pipeline. And, and I just told you guys to do all this stuff by hand because it'll be a good experience to play through. But there's also the HPO pipeline, which does all of this perturbation of the different, you know, hyperparameters and, and changes them around. And if you say, I've got, you know, 10 hours for my computer to run, please do your best to find the best results in that time. It will, it will do that. So you can say, you know, I want you to use this model, but please do your best to permute through all the other parameters and use um, the most appropriate either random searching technique or Bayesian searching tech. Yeah, there's a Bayesian probabilistic optimizer for hyperparameter optimization, which is kind of cool. Um, there's also the grid search, which is pretty classic for hyperparameter optimization, but um, you don't have time to do grid search over all the possible parameters. It's not, it's not feasible, there's no way. So, so maybe you wanna look into HPO pipeline. I'm not gonna explain it right now because uh, I, think, I think it is a learning experience. You should try doing a couple things by hand and comparing them as you go. Uh, and also, if you try looking into the HPO pipeline, you can tell me if there's enough documentation or not. There's a lot to it, so um, maybe the documentation isn't good enough for you to even use. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, are uh, that, like, um, sorry, the Bayesian 
optimization that you have there? Is it something you implemented or are you using a different backend for that? Oh, good question. I didn't implement this one. We it's it's so the specific kind of Bayesian approach is called tree parson estimator. And it's implemented inside a hyperparameter optimization library, which isn't specific to knowledge graph embedding models. It's very useful for any kind of machine learning. It's called Optuna. They have a really, really nice interface. And uh, with, with a lot of pain, I've integrated that very tightly with a lot of the PyKeen stuff. So you have kind of, you know, you can, you can also say like model equals rotate and then data set equals um, nations. And then you can say, uh, model quarks. Remember like before we had this model quarks where you could have the dict and then you said embedding embedding dim equals 40. Well this time you could do model quarks ranges and then you can say embedding dim equals dict low equals 50, high equals 200, step equals 50. So then it knows, like, do your best to, to search through this space. Nice. And, and these uh, args in the uh, embedding uh, dim dict, this low, high, and Q, these are uh, the ones coming from Optuna. No, no. This is this is okay. sort of the PyKeen specific, you know, um, interface that tells Optuna what to do. Optuna has a very okay. similar interface, but this is what I decided on to be the nicest looking you know, structure. Maybe it's not. If you guys don't think it is, then maybe make updates to it. But for, for some of our uses, this actually worked really well, especially for the models where like you might have a second parameter and you want to optimize over two of them at the same time. Or, you know, you might also have like loss equals an SSA. And then you might have loss quarks ranges. And remember there were two different, um, arguments for this one. The first one was um, margin. And uh, for margin, actually, you might want to use a categorical. And then I think it's like values. And so you can do like 1.0, 2.0, because yeah, usually people are just picking a margin that's an integer. Um, even though I wrote it as a flow, okay, let's write it as integer. And then there's this adverse. Mm -hmm. This looks really nice. Like, I just want to like give a shout out to saying that this looks really nice because um, I tried to uh, integrate something like this uh, from Hyperopt, which I think is like one of the competing frameworks. To yeah, Hyperopt is really cool too. Yeah, but it was also like a pain to try to figure mm -hmm. out how to integrate all of this. And I think all things considered, this looks like a nice way of doing it. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I what I came to realize is, is probably the same as you as Hyperopt seemed like it was actually more powerful, but it was a little less user friendly. I'm sorry to hear that because I think that Hyperopt had some user friendliness issues already. <laughs> no, no, that's what I said. I, I think I think that Hyperopt is more powerful, but I, ha I think the user interface was a little worse. Oh, gotcha. Okay, cool. Then I'm happy to hear that because for my next time, I'll try to use Optuna. Yeah, I, I mean, I never really, well, after I evaluated it, I never really went into using Hyperopt. But but I know that they have a lot more different things implemented that would be nice if Optuna also had them. But, you know, in the end, we, we can also do some other nice stuff. We can be like, um, uh, what's it called? I think it's called sampler. Yeah, we can either say sampler equals, you know, random, or we could say sampler equals TPE. And then it knows to like look up the different module that it uses for that. And then it just kind of off offloads it to Optuna. And then you don't have to think about it anymore. Okay, so so everyone's got their task, right? We're gonna we're gonna try and, and learn about the kinships data set. Um, you may actually want to like Google the kinships data set and figure out what it is. It's uh, it's about an Australian uh, indigenous tribe and its social network. It's really fascinating. I don't I don't know why this is the one that everyone likes so much, but it's got a really nice paper from like the 50s, I think, uh, about this tribe. And then people started using it for knowledge graph embedding, I guess. So yeah, do your best to try and try and use this code to, to train some models, see if you can perform well. If you don't perform well, see if you change the settings and it makes a, a better, or maybe you find that you're just using a model that's not really good for it. Some models are better for some things than others. It's, uh, it's tricky because you, it's hard to know like what's every model good for. So. Take this next week to play around, ask questions. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the time being. Um, 
And then I, yeah, I didn't get to the part that I said I would get to, um, which was how do we put our own data sets into this? And also how do we, how do we do Indra to, to knowledge graph embedding? Because, you know, I've been talking about this Indra to knowledge graph embedding thing for a couple of years, and then I've been you know, sidetracked by this and that. Um, so, so let me like do a really, really, really quick demo. Okay. So I'm going to get Indra content with PyBell because I'm a terrible person. <laughs> Um, and, and also because, <laughs> because you guys don't have a from Emma interface. Oh, you do. You do have a from Emma interface, don't you? I think uh, we, I think we were going to add that to the Emma web service. I don't know. I can't remember where we are on that though. Is it called COVID? Yeah. Well, so, so you can, you can just copy the code that I wrote because yeah, it's COVID-19. Yeah. All right. So we're going to get the graph. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give some feedback because there's not a perfect conversion from Indra into PyBell these days. Maybe one day we'll go back and fix some of that stuff. It's probably a good idea. We should do that soon. Yeah. Um, okay. So while you're, I, I had a sort of a, well, I, um, actually, no, why don't you finish up and then, um, and then maybe I'll come ping you offline or something like that. That's some questions. Oh, okay. This, this might take, a, I should have used the RAS model instead of the COVID-19 one. Oh Can yeah. Stop it's it? pretty big. Yeah, it's big. I'm going to try the RAS model because this one's maybe only 2,000 or something. The RAS model is the, um, the handmade one, right? Not the... Yes, that's okay, the good. one I... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so graph.summarize. And for everyone who's been using PyBell, I just added a new feature into the summarize thing. We get much better summaries these days. Oh, no! No, we don't. <laughs> Sorry. I lied about that. It, it'll be up like tomorrow or something. Okay, so um, so we do pi. Uh, we have to import some more PyBell stuff. Import pybell.io.tsv.api. Okay, so somewhere there's this magical function in PyBell to make like triples from a bell graph. Okay, okay, we get some some angry warnings, and so now now what I have right here is this NumPy array. Oh no, it's just a regular array. I guess I better import NumPy. I'm not sure what happens if you put a, a normal array into PyKeen. It might it might get upset. So so then we have you know from PyKeen dot triples import triples factory, and so we can make a triples factory. I'm going to call this one uh, RAS factory, and we just put the triples in. I think we have to do triples equals triples. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to. See what happens. Okay, it didn't like that. Um, oh yeah, you have to say it by name. It has to be triples because you can also give it a path. So if you already have the triples programmatically, you could say triples equals triples. And so you know this is the yeah. Well, that doesn't help us as much. So we've got known entities under twenty five. So the problem is we just have like one triples factory, and to do training we need two. We need to split it into testing and training. So wouldn't it be nice if we just had a split method? And then we get two triples factories back. Hmm. So, yeah. I'm curious about the split method. Like, I'm curious about how the data data gets split. Whether it's just like randomly selected triples, or if there's some other kind of algorithm behind it. Yeah, there's there's a couple problems with doing random selection, but it's kind of one of the. Yeah. So, so at its core, this is randomly splitting them in half. The issue is you need to go back and make sure that there aren't any, um, any nodes that are in the testing set, but not in the training set. So what you do, like, is a very simple method is you can do a random split and then you take all the stuff that is, is mistakenly in the testing set, just put it back in the training set. And like by random chance, usually this works out. And if it doesn't work out, you just run the split method again until it does. Is there any idea in the, uh, maybe it doesn't matter, but I'm just curious, is there any idea about um, splitting the graph somehow um, based on the relations, like so that some kind of subpart, uh, subparts of the graph are in the test set versus in the training set? Yep. This, this is, um, I would say this is something that I've been working on that 
I don't think we're going to publish it fast enough for it to be like the first one. But I, I tell you what the interesting thing that you can do is you can say, I want to take out all of the protein protein interactions. And then I want to train my graph based on everything but the protein protein interactions. And then validate on its ability to predict protein protein interactions. This is called the leave one type out uh, hmm. evaluation. Okay, maybe protein protein interactions would be a bad one, but in a graph that has, um, you know, drugs and diseases and proteins, if you take out all the drug to disease links and then you train the graph that way, and then you can still predict which drugs should go with which disease, you're really, really in a good place because it means that your model is able to generalize to totally new ideas. Um, yeah, you know, my, my master's student, Rana Aldisi, she did that and it worked and we're really, really happy with it, though we haven't published it. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, and, and then there's this other um, wild way of thinking about it. What about uh, splitting it based on publication date? So let's say that you, you want to train on everything before 2005. Okay, maybe 2010. John, you can pick the best year that you think is most appropriate. Let's say you train your whole model based on everything before 2010, and you predict and evaluate based on everything after 2010. So, uh, so you can kind of do this like post hoc idea of like, would our model be able to capitulate the stuff that was learned and like really published for real after in the next 10 years? This is a very hard task. It doesn't work so well. But it's, it's interesting, you know, there was this study that did this in material science. I think it was in like Science from Nature, um, where I think they validated their model in that way. Although the thing you have to be careful of is if you're using text mining output that you don't pull in conjectured things from the future work. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Right? Like we, 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 you know, you get the idea. Um, but yeah, no, I think that would be really interesting. Um, are you, are you wrapping up or I, uh, yeah, yeah really I'm done. Cool. Let's, let's, uh, let's call it a day. And anyone who wants to talk on the Slack chat after I'm, I'm still around. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlie. This is yeah, you're welcome. Paul. So you guys all have your homework assignment. You better do it. Otherwise uh, you're going to get a bad grade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.